So the last nutrient I talked about in this series, I referred to it as the screws of the body. I considered calling it the glue of the body's many structural components, but I think that title fits today's nutrients much better. If for no other reason than because that one was a metal and this one's not. But also, when you use screws, you tend to use them more conservatively. That is to say, you'll likely use less of them, and you'll use them in a more specific manner. Glue, on the other hand, is anything but conservative. It's akin to duct tape in the sense that if something's not staying, just use more. I mean, we instinctively know from a young age to use half the bottle on a simple cut and paste, and maybe some of y'all even ate some. But as we grow a bit older, we begin to have more uses for glue. We learn that it could be molded into different shapes. I don't know about you, but glue sticks were a big deal for me to learn that the right amount of a material can be key for a project's structural integrity. And one day, our eyes are truly open to what glue can do, and we have a whole new respect for it. We hear about hot glue and wood glue, super glue, fabric glue, suddenly so many of the things we wanted to build or repair as kids feel a lot more real. By the way, you've just subconsciously been spoiled of the entire video, and for the record, no, I have never talked about glue this much in my entire life. But enough about adhesives, we're here to talk about nutrition, so let's delve back into the true nutrients. Phosphorus is an essential nutrient, meaning that it's needed for optimal bodily health, but the body does not produce it on its own, thus it must be consumed. Phosphorus is a mineral, an inorganic compound that originates mainly in soil and works its way up the food chain until we consume it. The element itself was first discovered in 1669 by German alchemist Hennig Brand, but it wasn't widely recognized as nutritionally relevant until the late 19th century. Phosphorus is considered a major mineral, meaning it's needed in much higher quantities quantities than most, like sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Phosphorus is also notably the only non-metal major mineral. The average human body contains between 550 and 850 grams, making it one of the most abundant minerals in the body. About 85% of that is stored alongside calcium in the bones. Phosphorus homeostasis is mainly regulated by the kidneys and bones, and it is a bioavailable mineral, with the absorption rates at roughly 60% from animal sources and 40% from plant foods. Because of this, phosphorus is far from the most commonly deficient mineral, and thus it's not required to be on a standard food label. Now, let's take a quick look at what this non-metal mineral is actually doing in our bodies. The majority of the functions of phosphorus come from it being a key component of something called a phosphate group, so we'll start there. A phosphate group is simply a phosphorus atom bound to four oxygen atoms, but it really is the body's glue. And I'll begin with the function that you already probably most associate phosphorus with, the health and structural integrity of your bones and teeth. Calcium phosphate, a compound we've covered before, is obviously made up of calcium and phosphate. It provides structure and hardness to bones, which in turn provides constitution to the whole body and directly combats the fairly common disease osteoporosis. If you want more on this, I will point you to the calcium video because we have much more to cover here. Like the fact that phosphate groups are also a key component of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, it's literally in the name. ATP is what's known as a nucleotide, and it's made up of a nitrogenous base, in this case adenine, a ribose sugar, and as the name suggests, three phosphate groups. ATP is essentially the final product acting as the body's primary energy source, and phosphorus is notably the only mineral in it. In a similar vein, phosphate groups are also a crucial structural component in DNA and RNA. DNA is a complex double-stranded molecule made of deoxyribose, a few nitrogenous bases, notably thymine, and phosphate groups. DNA essentially functions in storing genetic information. All the while, RNA is a single-stranded molecule made of ribose, nitrogenous bases, uniquely uracil, but still phosphate groups. RNA acts as a messenger between DNA and these organelles called ribosomes, which synthesize proteins. So to put all that in English, without phosphorus, your body would be incapable of making genes and proteins and proper creation of new cells. But that's not all, because we can take phosphate groups a step further, as as they are a large piece of something called phospholipids. Phospholipids are a class of lipid defined by having a phosphate group as the head and two tails made of fatty acids, usually a saturated and unsaturated fatty acid. And this time, a compound called glycerol, a naturally occurring alcohol, fills the role of glue, keeping the head and tails together. Phospholipids' main function is to structurally make up your cell membranes. What is known as the phospholipid bilayer, for obvious reasons, 
reasons acts as a gate of sorts, allowing some molecules through while blocking others. Phospholipids are also used to regulate a process called apoptosis, the natural and controlled death of cells so the body develops as it's supposed to. And phosphorus also plays a role in carbohydrate and fat metabolism, nerve signaling, kidney function, maintaining balance of certain micronutrients including vitamin D, iron, magnesium, and zinc, and much more. Phosphorus is very prominent in the body and it's used for a lot. Due to having so many functions in the body, and with as much as it's constantly needed, it is recommended to consume adequate amounts of phosphorus daily. The recommended intake of phosphorus is 700 milligrams for both men and women, but 1250 for teens in order to handle development at that age. That being said, in adults, the average consumption is about 1200 to 1600 milligrams, which is comfortably above the recommended amounts. However, phosphorus deficiency does exist. It's called hypophosphatemia. Mild hypophosphatemia is actually fairly common, affecting about 5% of the world's population. It can be due to malnutrition, but usually goes alongside other health concerns like diabetes, alcoholism, or kidney or thyroid issues. Symptoms of phosphorus deficiency include poor bone health, joint pain, fatigue, trouble breathing, loss of appetite, changes in body weight, and in more extreme cases, osteoporosis, osteomalacia, and rickets. The daily upper limit of phosphorus is 4,000 milligrams, and having too much phosphorus, hyperphosphatemia, isn't extremely rare either. It usually occurs alongside some kind of chronic kidney disease. If you have any concerns with all of this, the best way to measure your phosphorus levels is with a blood test. And finally, the last stretch, let's talk about good sources of phosphorus. First, animal sources, the more bioavailable choice. The most nutrient-dense foods per gram are seafood like cuttlefish, carp, sardines, and scallops, and most cheeses. Dairy in general is a consistently good source of phosphorus. Red meats and poultry meats are consistently lower in the nutrient than seafood, but almost all meats will notably contribute to your phosphorus intake. On the other side, plant foods are noticeably less bioavailable, but there are still plenty of options. Those mainly come in the form of seeds like hemp, chia, flax, and sesame seeds, nuts like Brazil nuts, cashews, almonds, and pistachios, and soy and oats. Pretty much any legume-like plant will solidly contribute to your phosphorus intake. Many types of phosphorus supplements are available, but they are not needed very often. And there you have it, the last major mineral in the books. I'll be honest, even I was surprised at all the ways that phosphorus holds the body together. And realistically, I probably should have talked about it sooner. So you heard it here first. Eat your glue. It does the body good. Now, if you enjoyed the video, or at the very least learned a little something, I encourage you to subscribe as I've got plenty more of these on the way. Go ahead and let me know down in the comments what other nutrients you think deserve an entire in-depth breakdown video like this. And remember that all I ask is that you do your own research and advocate for your body. You only get the one.